Welcome to the third session of Bridging Faith and Science, our ongoing series to expand the conversation around substance abuse disorder and the opioid crisis and drive action to save lives, spread hope, and support healing. I'd like to begin by thanking our partners in the series, the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, represented today by Dr. Dean Ellen McKenzie, and the Center for Responsible Leadership, represented by their chair, His Excellency Dr. Muhammad Alisa. You'll be hearing from both of them shortly. I also want to thank the really remarkable people who will be taking part in the conversation in just a couple of minutes. Our moderator, my longtime friend Patrick Kennedy, and our panelists, Dr. Chinazo Cunningham and Rabbi Arthur Schneier, another longtime friend. This series is all about how much progress we can make when faith and science communities work hand in hand to address substance abuse disorder. I'm excited to announce that we, along with our partners, have now convened an executive committee comprised of scientists and faith leaders to develop a pledge that includes a statement of shared beliefs about substance abuse disorder and the role of faith leaders in confronting the crisis, as well as a list of actionable items that can be implemented by faith leaders within their own communities. We hope to share these items at an in-person convening later this year when we can all gather safely. Today's virtual gathering could not be coming at a more urgent time. The number of overdose deaths since 1999, when the CDC began recording them, is soon expected to pass the one million mark. And what should really alarm us is that the number of deaths are trending up, not down. According to CDC data released last November, more than 100,000 lives were lost to overdoses in the United States during the 12-month period ending in April 2021, the most of any year on record. 100,000 deaths equates to 274 fatal overdose a day, 11 deaths an hour, another life lost every five minutes. Even more disturbing, this figure doesn't even include the additional 88,000 deaths from alcohol and 46,000 from suicide. Over this same 12-month period, overdose deaths from synthetic opioids like fentanyl natural and semi-synthetic opioids like prescription pain medication, and stimulants such as methamphetamine and cocaine all increased. As I've said many times, this is about far more than statistics. You all know very well that behind every one of these numbers is a real person, someone with a real life, a real story, people who really love them. I know that firsthand. Hillary and I have had several good friends who have lost their own children to overdoses in recent years. We need, all of us, to be involved in ending this national public health crisis. The good news is that we do have extensive data showing the successful and cost-effective prevention, treatment, recovery, and harm reduction strategies that do save lives. We need to keep developing and replicating creative solutions. And most important, we need to make these solutions accessible to everyone who needs them. In order to do that, we have to overcome the stigma around addiction that is still too deeply rooted across our society. For individuals and families, the shame they associate with addiction still keeps too many from seeking help. Some don't seek help because they can't afford the cost of care or lack adequate coverage. Others think it will have a negative effect on their jobs or their standing in the community. Some don't know where to turn for help. For communities and society at large, stigma keeps addiction misunderstood, underfunded, and undertreated, with too many people still suffering in silence. Despite advances in understanding addiction as a health condition and federal laws that require parity for mental health and substance abuse disorder benefits, the first of which I was glad to sign and the second of which was sponsored by Congressman Kennedy, our moderator for today's conversations. Despite those things, treatment for substance abuse disorder remains largely separate from mainstream health care. This only helps to perpetuate the stigma we can and must work together to change that reality. Experience shows that faith leaders are some of the most effective partners and messengers in helping to overcome stigma. They're a trusted source of support, 
or their congregates in times of crisis. Their ability to educate, motivate, and mobilize their communities is second to none. Spreading the message that addiction is a treatable disease rather than a moral failing is key to fighting and beating the epidemic, and the faith-based community can lead the way with messages that are both consistent with their deeply held beliefs and grounded in the best available public health science. I grew up in a family affected by addiction. I know how hard it is to talk about, but that's exactly what we have to do. We need to encourage people to reach out for help and embrace them when they do. We also need to recognize the courage that it takes to take that first step and help them on what is sure to be at times a difficult road ahead. Our conversation today is about helping the religious and scientific communities to better understand each other's needs so we can better focus our individual and collective efforts. It's about listening to and learning from one another so we can find a common language that ultimately will help us save the lives of friends, family members, neighbors, and congregants. As you're listening to the conversation today, I hope you'll all think about and share with us what needs you have. If you're a member of the scientific community, what's the one most important thing the faith-based community can do for you? And vice versa for those in the faith-based community. I also hope you'll keep in mind that we're still just beginning this journey together. And it's up to all of us to sustain our efforts and link them to actions that reflect both the scientific evidence and our deeply held beliefs. I'm very grateful to all of you for being part of this important work, and I look forward to a productive conversation. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Ellen McKenzie, Dean of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. It is my great pleasure, once again, to be joining President Clinton and His Excellency Dr. Mohammed bin Abdul Karim Alissa to host this series of conversations with esteemed leaders from the faith and science communities. The matters at hand are so important, namely to identify ways that together we can realize a healthy and safe path beyond this nation's ongoing struggle with substance use disorders and the disease of addiction. This is the third conversation in our series. In the first, we focused on disparities and equity and how to ensure that faith and science leaders work together to reach and benefit diverse and often underserved populations. In our second conversation, we explore the intersection of faith, science, and policy, since it is vital that our policymakers hear from the faith community who are ministering to the sick and weary about their experiences and what they see and hear from the front lines of this epidemic. And in today's conversation, we will del delve into stigma and parity, two issues that are critical to overcoming the current crisis. I am eager to hear from our guests today, Congressman Kennedy, Dr. Cunningham, and Rob Rabbi Schneier, about how we can treat people with substance use disorders with a dignity and holistic care that reflects humanity's ideals. The addiction and overdose epidemic affects us all, and there are very serious challenges that remain and lie ahead. But the increasing recognition of the important interplay between the faith and science gives me hope. And, and I continue to welcome the opportunity to provide a space where ambassadors from science and faith can share what unites us and to find a way forward for a better tomorrow. We at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health stand ready to help identify and advocate for evidence-informed strategies to reduce the devastating toll of addiction and overdose on individuals, families, and communities. We can only address this epidemic by working together and harnessing the tremendous power of our institutions, our networks, and our communities. Thank you again for joining us today and for all of your efforts to address this public health epidemic. And next, I would like to introduce His Excellency. Fakhamat al-Rais al-Sayyid Bill Clinton, al-Sayyid Aileen McKinsey, al-Sayyid al-Hakham Arthur Schneier, Sa'adat Rais al-Jalsa wa al-Mutahadithin, asdiqai ila'izza al-Munzammin ilayna abra al-Internet. Yatibu li an urahiba bikum jami'an fi liqa'ina al-Thalith, بينما نواصل العمل على تكامل إسهاماتنا 
من أجل الحد من الآثار السلبية لأزمة الإدمان مؤسسين معا شراكة قد تكون الأبرز من نوعها بين مركز القيادة المسؤولة ومؤسسة كلينتون وجامعة جونز هوبكنز شراكة تعالج هذه القضية من زوايا أوسع وبجهد أكثر تكاملا وأريد اليوم أن أتجاوز الحديث عن المشكلة وأسبابها وتداعياتها إلى حديث آخر فقد أعطيتم مشكورين وبإخلاص ومهنية عالية أعطيتم هذا الحديث حقه في لقاءاتنا السابقة واسمحوا لي أن أتحدث إليكم بصراحة لقد أخفقت غالب الجهود المنفردة ورأينا الشراكات المعقودة بمعزل عن الإيمان لم تذهب بعيدا في تحقيق النتائج المرجوة لكننا في مركز القيادة المسؤولة لدينا قناعة تامة بالدور المهم الذي يمكن أن يقوم به الإيمان في مواجهة هذا الوباء وتوفير الحماية منه لمجتمعاتنا حول العالم وخصوصا فئة الشباب فمثلما هم الفئة الأكثر عرضة للخطر هم أيضا العاطفة الأشد توقدا والأكثر تقبلا للتأثير الروحي والإيمان أيها السيدات والسادة يتميز بقيمة التواضع وتجاوز الفروق الطبقية ويتميز القادة الدينيون بالقرب الشديد من الناس والمعرفة الحميمية بالأتباع وعدم المجازفة في إطلاق الأحكام وقد أمر الخالق سبحانه المؤمنين بأن لا يسخر أحد من أحد فقال يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا يسخر قوم من قوم عسى أن يكونوا خيرا منهم نعم إن من تسخر منه قد يكون خيرا منك فضلا عن كون السخرية في ذاتها خلقا ذميما في جميع الأحوال شخصيا أؤمن بأن إعطاء هذا الركن المهم دوره من خلال هذه الشراكة المباركة التي نعتز بها سيكمل بإذن الله معادلة الحل وأؤمن أيضا بأننا جاهزون جميعا لهذه اللحظة من أجل أن نباشر وضع برامج العمل المحددة بجداولها الزمنية وآلياتها التنفيذية من أجل أن نصل إلى نتائج تلبي طموحاتنا في حماية عالمنا من هذه الآفة المدمرة ولن أخذ من وقتكم أكثر من ذلك وأشكر للجميع إصغاءهم وأدعو الله أن يسدد الجهود ويكللها بالنجاح وشكرا لكم I first want to thank uh, President Clinton for this opportunity to convene this important discussion with two preeminent uh, uh, individuals who've spent their lives advancing the uh, work of both science and faith. Um, first, Dr. Cunningham, who is currently uh, director of the New York Office of Addiction Support and Services, and then Rabbi Schneier, who's the East uh, Park East Synagogue, but most importantly, founder of the uh, uh, foundation of conscience, appeal of conscience, and also a, a Holocaust survivor. So let me uh, begin, uh, Rabbi Schneier, by acknowledging that and also acknowledging the uh, recent World Remembrance Day of the Holocaust and, and thank you for your lifetime of uh, raising the conscience of all people around the world about Uh, not only that tragic uh, historical event uh, that's uh, beyond compare, but what it has to teach us about our common humanity, because that can really lay the foundation for our conversation today. Uh, Rabbi Schneier, thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you, Congressman Kennedy, uh, Patrick. I say amen to what you said before. Uh, I'm honored uh, to be on this program convened by my dear friend, President Clinton, whom I had the privilege of serving in our joint determination to hear the cry of the oppressed, to hear the cry of the vulnerable. And that's exactly what this is all about, too. Also, I want to express my um, appreciation to Dr. Alisa, a partner in interreligious cooperation, uh, who uh, certainly 
joined with me in making sure that religious communities should be united in terms of facing the challenges humanity faces today. But above all, uh, John Hopkins, uh, we had a wonderful mayor in the city of New York, Mike Bloomberg, now it's called the uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health. And Mike has done so many good things. Again, another joint project. And finally, a, uh, the uh, Center for Responsible Leadership. And uh, I was honored by them. And uh, I, it's a wonderful, wonderful marriage of uh, you know, organizations and can do a lot. But now my partner, Dr. Cunningham, uh, you represent science and I represent the faith, but we're not separate. Actually, we're inseparable. We're interwoven. And actually, uh, what we have faced during this COVID pandemic shows you that uh, in order to persevere, in order to preserve your sanity at a time of crisis, you do need faith, you do need hope. And at the other hand, if not for the RNA research that has been done for years, that Biogen, and particularly my friend Dr. Berla, had the courage, had the courage uh, to uh, join forces with that small firm and come up with a vaccine that has saved hundreds of thousands of human lives. And also uh, uh, Moderna, an Armenian co-sponsor of that wonderful organization. So you see that there are benefits on a daily basis that are inseparable, the contribution of the science community to our daily lives. And what we can only offer is meaning in life. Uh, I don't want to uh, go into a, a anatomy, analysis, but you know the brain, uh, in fact, Martin Luther King said that, actually has two themes, the same hemisphere. We have the hemisphere of uh, faith and the hemisphere of, of, of science. And that has to work together in order to say uh, a, a serious challenge that our nation faces in the terms of addiction and the opioid crisis is not only for us. Unfortunately, uh, we find it uh, a phenomenon throughout the world. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, Cunningham. I wanna ask you about what role you see for the faith community. As, as you know, these illnesses have been stigmatized because of uh, past temperance movements and the like that have talked about the evils of uh, these, uh, of drugs and alcohol, and hence uh, it's often a, a moral um, judgment that's made on those suffering from, uh, from a biological um, illness uh, of addiction. Um, but could you talk a little bit about that, that role of faith leadership in helping us address a stigma. Um, sure. So I, I just want to start out by also um, just thanking, you know, um, all the organizers for inviting me. I'm honored to be here to be part of this um, discussion and really talking about something that, you know, doesn't come up very frequently. So, you know, I've been a physician for over 20 years practicing medicine and, and working uh, in the field of addiction. And, and this is the first time that I've been at a panel um, or a discussion around faith and science. And so I really appreciate sort of what that, you know, this this is unique and sort of what it brings to the table and that, you know, we really need to think about sort of all of the aspects of care and leverage the strengths in the community and in the faith community and working together. Um, so for me, just on a personal level, um, I grew up in the Catholic church. Um, I got married in the Catholic church and I raised my three daughters in the Catholic church. And so, it, so faith has been a part of my life, um, you know, for many, many years. And what I would say in terms of science is, you know, it's, it's complicated. Um, that's how I feel personally. 
So I think there are many strengths um, that we can build on when it comes to, you know, um, faith and faith-based organizations. And so trust is really a huge part, um, you know, and, and really necessary as we've seen during the COVID uh, pandemic, um, you know, that um, f- for me, the church has been very empathetic and welcoming and, you know, has a long, long history of serving those um, who are in need, serving those who are vulnerable and, you know, serving those who are really kind of invisible in our society. And and I've always seen that as a role for me as, as a physician and as somebody in public health and in research to be able to sort of bring the voices of my patients, particularly those, you know, who have stigmatized conditions like addiction, um, bringing their voices to the table. Um, I also see some challenges, and I think a lot of that really is about, um, a, you know, uh, stigma, as you mentioned, Congressman Kennedy. Um, so we know that there's a lot of discussion around morality. Um, there's a lot of shame and guilt. Um, and so, and and that can be very challenging for people with addiction. And in fact, I would say that, you know, shame ha- has such a role in, um, you know, people sort of not seeking care, um, not being able to be honest with themselves, with their family members, with their providers. Um, and so getting past that and dealing with that is, is really critical to be able to really move forward um, in addiction. Um, in addition, you know, I think it, the challenge, you know, about morality is this, is this, um, is addiction a problem with the individual person? Does it, you know, show that they're immoral? Does it show that they're weak? I mean, in science, we've really been trying to get away from that narrative and really talk about how addiction is a medical condition. And so, you know, I think part of this is, you know, does it have to be an either or? Does it have to be, a, you know, this dichotomous yes or no? Or, you know, how do we think about these things together? I think that's really the big question. Um, and then just, you know, from, from my you know personal standpoint, too, in seeing patients for 20 years, I've also seen the role of religion and faith in, in their lives and the importance of that. And so, um, so I think, you know, this is definitely an important topic. I think it's not easy. I think it's a bit challenging. Um, but certainly there are ways in which science and faith um, really can work together to get the best of both worlds. So just to follow that up, uh, doctor, and um, we often in recovery refer to the seven deadly sins as, or our character flaws as essential to tackle in order to live a life of sobriety. Um, when I think of pride, anger, envy, greed, lust, gluttony, and sloth, um, I think of uh, of things sins, right? That's what they are. But explain the neurobiological components of this before we go to the rabbi, because um, I just read the dopamine nation, and and it's clear to me people with addiction are constantly pushing the buttons to get their dopamine going. And of course, exhilaration of being prideful, exhilaration of being addicted to food, sex, um, anger, uh, resentment. Those are things that we say are sins, but but they're driven by the neurobiology of, of a real re- reinforcement we get from, from acting out on those impulses. So could you explain a little bit of that so we can put this in context? Um, absolutely. Um, So we know that what happens when people take, for example, an opioid, um, that over time, and this happens across all human beings, so if human beings take opioids at a high enough dose for a long enough period of time, there will will be changes in the brain um, in terms of uh, the, the biology and the sort of neural synapses. And so what happens is, is, with that time and with those changes, if people do not get opioids into their system, they will have a withdrawal syndrome that is physical and psychological, right? And so that withdrawal syndrome, and it's the same for every human being, includes, you know, blood pressure going up, heart rate going up, sweating, you know, diarrhea, pain, and a whole a whole host of things that happen. 
So that's not about morality and, and willpower, right? That's about the biology of what happens in our, in our, in our system, in the human body, um, when there's opioids taken for a long enough period of time, and then when you remove that. And so that, those, that circuit of not having enough of one substance leading to this withdrawal syndrome then leads people to seek that substance so that the, the withdrawal syndrome then, then stops. And, and that's exactly what happens. And so it's, it's, it's it really in so much of what we do in addiction treatment, for example, is use medications that help to sort of break that cycle. Um, but but that is what happens across every human being that is very, very well known. And that speaks to this, the biology and the changes um, that people that happen in the human body when a substance is taken for a long period of time. Yes. Yeah, so as we know, a lot of addictions are uh, predicated on the on the brain's desire to, to fill some maybe deficit in, in somewhere in the neurotransmitters and they self-medicate and those things become addiction. So um, I always believe that the two are uh, mental illness and addiction are obviously um, addiction is a mental illness. So there is a comorbidity there and, and a lot of the compulsion obsession um, it is also, even without opioids, uh, can serve as an addictive um, component in our uh, response to outside stimuli. And I'm mentioning that in the context of this discussion about sins, uh, because it's part of what I think keeps that stigma that you mentioned going so strong. So, Rabbi, could you talk a little bit about uh, how you, in the course of being um, an advisor, a faith advisor to your community, help them understand the science behind their uh, feelings of moral failure? Uh, first of all, an addiction is not a uh, sin. It is not a moral failure. It's a disease. It's a disease. And it has to be treated that way. Because otherwise, you have shame, you have guilt, which complicates matter, loss of hope, frustration, suicide, isolation, withdrawal. Uh, I want to be personal, going through the Holocaust. What kept me going was my faith. And my favorite psalm, which is familiar to all of you, is Psalm 118. In distress I called upon the Lord. He answered my prayers. God is with me. I am not afraid. Now I am sure, Patrick, that your faith has helped you during your times of addiction. And you're public. And you're not ashamed. So remember Psalm 118, in distress I call upon the Lord. And I can tell you during the two years of the pandemic, I kept on going on Zoom. Prayer, perseverance, patience, hope. That's exactly what is needed for any other. But not to be cut off from community. Someone to talk to. No stigma. No stigma. You don't have to go into hiding. You come in the forefront to ask for help. So I think this is where faith can play a very, very important role. I gave you my personal example. Patrick, I think, I'm sure you had that experience. And also in terms of Judaism, we have the 10 days of penitence during the High Holy Days. Yom Kippur is to be at one with God and with one with man. The Day of Atonement, to be at one, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And what do we say? You look at the scriptures, the Bible, or the Quran, or any, any holy book. You see failure, success, life is cyclical. 
And you don't have to go to Wall Street to understand that. The Dow goes up and down. A pandemic has an end. Life is cyclical. So if you are a failure, it does not mean that you're stuck in life, but you can emerge. And this is exactly what is needed. The problem we have now in the United States, although our dollar bill says in God we trust, and not only in the United States, but in the Western civilization, in Europe, unfortunately, the, our younger people have lost any contact with religious belief. Secularization has contributed, in my opinion, to the crisis we're facing today. So in a matter, we have an ideal partnership uh, that needs to be fostered, exactly what you're undertaking now. And that is a contribution so that the vulnerable people are not withdrawing. It, in a way, is restoring, giving them confidence, perseverance. That's what they need. Yeah, thank you, Rabbi. You are someone who gives. And I found that the basis for recovery is, as we know, in recovery is service to others. In fact, there's a well-known kind of phrase, service to others is the rent we pay for our room in heaven. And uh, I believe that um, that type of service and co connection is, is so important. But I want to address this idea That's of, okay, if I may interrupt for a moment. Yes. My favorite saying is, when you give bread, what do you get back? You get back sandwiches. <laughs> Good okay? stuff. Good stuff. Okay? You give bread, you get back sandwiches. Okay? Well, um, let me ask you about the moral dimension, though, because, for example, in recovery, we have a moral responsibility to do everything in our power not to relapse into addiction. We have um, been achieved sobriety. We've achieved some distance from the compulsion and, and if you will, the allergy to uh, the drug or the alcohol. But we have a moral responsibility for that. Um, and, and there is like this notion of good and evil um, so I'd like you to talk to, to that because um, we often in recovery talk about the demons uh, of, of life centering us on ourselves as opposed to helping others. And, and you said one with God. It's not one with yourself. You have to be helping others. So talk a little bit about that so we can understand what people talk about in terms of that. I think that uh, the idea of reward when you recover. Recovery is a success. And you have to be commended for that. You have to be rewarded for that. And if I may go back again to our Jewish tradition, we pay a tremendous tribute to the Baal Tshuva, to those who have returned, to those who have given up uh, the uh, misdeeds. We honor those people. We honor those people. And we say, ah, oh, you're fantastic. You're unbelievable. You made it. You weathered the storm. You emerged. So it's a matter of confidence building in order to avoid a relapse. And that confidence building, that compliment, it's like dealing with a child. If a child performs well, don't keep it a secret in expressing your gratitude, your admiration, your appreciation. The uh, political pollsters, what are they doing? Okay? President doing well, and you as a Kennedy, you understand that better than anyone else. So it's a matter of confidence building to avoid relapse. So, um, Dr. Cunningham, let me ask you about, first of all, thank you for being in your profession. 
Um, your profession saved my life. Um, uh, thank God there were uh, people who studied the science and understood how to treat my opioid use disorder and who also understand the impact of all my other physical conditions on my vulnerabilities to relapse into my opioid use disorder or into an alcohol use disorder or into a stimulant use disorder or anything else that I might become addicted to because that is the nature of my brain today. Um, thank you for that. And let me ask you though, it isn't a meaning so important to the re recovery of your patients, to, to the rabbi's point of finding meaning and connection and community there is a biological underpinning for that. It, it's there's some science behind that altruism. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think this the the sense of meaning, as you said, is incredibly important um, to people, especially you know, having come from an addiction. What I hear frequently um, with my patients is that um, they've lived a life that's been numb right? That's been um, cloudy and numb. And so sort of removing the substance from them allows them to then feel again and feel, you know, both good and bad. And, and, and all of that has incredible meaning. You know, I think also, you know, I, I, I really agree with, with what the rabbi said about the confidence. Um, I think what we hear so much in the world of addiction is how people have failed over and over again. They failed themselves, they failed their families. And, you know, treatment is challenging too. And so often people, you know, may fail in their treatment attempts and it may take several times for people to really to really be ready and to engage in their treatment as, as you know, in, in a way that um, positions them at best for success. And so having a, a lifetime of failures you know, it really has a tremendous effect on the psyche. And so really being able to then contribute, to find meaning, to give back, to feel the confidence that they're, they're really, you know, succeeding is so important. And I think this is also um, something that's important that, that President Clinton mentioned too, is when we think about that, we think about that in, in terms of a harm reduction approach, because not everybody's able to be fully abstinent, but people are able to move in their lives to areas that are um, more healthy. And so that might mean using less drugs or substances. That might mean using drugs or substances in a more healthy way, putting people at less risk. And I think that each one of the steps towards living a healthier life needs to be recognized as a step of success, right? That it's a ladder. And so building that, you know, that sense of that I can master this step and then there's another step and another step is really critical instead of the narrative that people have basically spent their whole life failing. Um, so so I think, in, you know, in all of these ways, that that meaning um, and that sort of connection to sort of giving back and recognizing, you know, the success in the step word fashion is an important part of, um, you know, really um, treating addiction and thinking about addiction. Uh, Patrick, may I point out that uh, all the rehab centers, and there are quite a few, on the religious auspices, part of the rehab program is also Bible study, Bible study, uh, faith study, uh, I can tell you, for instance, the, the Chabad centers, quite a few rehab centers, where they study the uh, Torah. Because our scriptures exactly describe the human condition, success and failure, failure and success. So I, I think that if this uh, could be incorporated on a, on a wider basis, like, for instance, if you have a knee operation, okay, you go to a rehab center. But if you have a, a whether it's a alcohol addiction or whether it's an opioid addiction, um, I am sure that also I know, for a fact, Catholic centers, rehab, not only 
the psychological part, not only the medical part, but also giving the faith, the hope that um, religion brings to the table. Yes, uh, as we know in this country, only half of the rehabs have medical doctors overseeing and supervising addiction care. One of the big challenges in implementing better policy is the application of medicine to this disease that you spoke eloquently about as a disease, a rabbi. And um, I really feel strongly to your point, Dr. Cunningham, that um, morally we are bereft when we say meet you where you are, but then as a society, we just say, we're going to leave you there too, because I'm all for uh, harm reduction, but I'm not for using it as a, a scapegoat for us to not do the next right thing, which is to help people uh, stand up. And unfortunately today, I see harm reduction as a default for not taking care of people in the same way with the same urgency and continuum of care that we would if they had some or some other illness. So Dr. Cunningham, could you talk a little bit about that? Because I'm all for meeting people where they are. I took on medication assisted treatment when I was uh, in recovery. I was not prepared psychically or spiritually to delve into uh, service, community, um, doing all the work that comes with recovery. But I, it was absolutely essential for me to survive. Today, I'm in a different part of my recovery, but most people don't even get there because uh, unfortunately, these supervised injection sites and other types of uh, efforts to meet people where they are, I think can really leave them there if we don't take a more proactive role in making sure that continuum is, is continued. Could you talk just a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I want to start out by pointing out that um, of all the people who have substance use disorders in this country, only 20% of them are receiving the treatment that they need. 20%. So that means that 80% of people are outside of our treatment system. And so I think when we think about harm reduction, it's bringing people in, right? It's engaging people into, you know, building trust. Um, and bringing them in, in in whatever way is possible to keep people alive. So some of it may be that people are not ready to start treatment. Some of it may be that people are not ready for the treatment and the way in which we deliver it in this country, right? But at the same time, we know that people are dying at unprecedented levels in this country. And so, you know, a harm reduction approach is first to, to help people stay alive and to help bring people into care. And when I say care, I think that's like the care sort of comprehensively, because some people may be more interested in getting housing or getting education or right um, getting back with their family members. And that might be a priority over stopping using a substance. And so a harm reduction community will respond to that, right? And so that so it's taking, you know, like you said, meeting people where they are. So if they're outside of the treatment system, you know, going out, doing outreach and, and, and you know, engaging them. And then, you know, working with them on what are their priorities, which may or may not be, you know, the substance use disorder. Um, and ultimately, over time, building trust and helping people to move towards a healthier life. Um, but that doesn't mean... Um, you know, basically saying it's abstinence or nothing, right? We're going to lose people if we have that approach. And we, we've we seen that. Um, so it's, you know, it, it is a way that is very much um, person-centered, non-judgmental, um, you know, um, taking into consideration what the goals are of, of the individual in front of us and helping them to move themselves into a healthier, um, you know, state. And so, again, that, that can include, um, you know, not I mean, not having them be at risk for infections, um, right, um, not having them be at risk for uh, overdose. Um, and, and, and in a lot of ways, we've done this in this country, but not, not around drugs. We've done this, for example, around alcohol when we say drink responsibly or don't drink and drive rather than saying don't drink, 
right? So there are ways in which the harm reduction principles have come out in this country. Um, I think that we are shifting now that because we are in really this unprecedented state in terms of the number of overdose deaths, that we that everything's on the table, that we need to consider every approach to keep people alive because what we've been doing in the past hasn't worked. That's why we are where we are. And so, yeah. you know, every and every, and there's no one answer, right? There's no one, one size fits all. And people are in different places in their life. Like you said, Patrick, a different place in your life before than you are now. And we need to be responsive to that. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I just worry that we're going to come in and we're not going to do that next handoff. So they get that next step up because people are going to think it's cheaper just to leave them where they are than to lift them up, especially given the inertia that we have in this country and actually getting them that care, as you said, to the 80 percent of the public that don't even get access to care to begin with, that we don't want to perpetuate that and tell people, oh, there's an easy solution. We'll just we'll just take care of them down here as opposed to giving them what their full humanity uh, demands. And that's full comprehensive care. Let me ask you on the on the drink responsibly because you, we know that 80% of the profits of the liquor industry come from the 20% who uh, drink excessively like myself so i always am very wary that um, there is a corporate interest in getting more people to drink um, they'll say drink responsibly but that's not how they they make their profits so um, i will tell you in new york i'm very disturbed that uh, you're going for commercialization of marijuana. My father, uh, Henry Waxman, who's also at Bloomberg and many others fought the uh, corporate leaders who were plugging tobacco in spite of and lying about its addictive nature. And I feel like if we want to address the systemic racism in our justice system that incarcerates too many people of color, then let's address that Let's not just uh, give a big hand hand out to corporate America to sell an addictive product. Um, how in the world during an addiction crisis and after what we've learned about addictive industries like Oxycontin and Purdue Pharma just made lots of profits off addiction. Why would we introduce another addiction industry into um, where the state becomes the biggest drug dealer? Um, you know, so, I mean, you know, what I would say is that with um, legalized cannabis, we, we know that, you know, the majority of states have legalized medical cannabis um, and uh, more and more states are legalizing adult use recreational cannabis. Um, I think that there's certainly, you know, as the um, amount of opioid use, you know, had increased, there was certainly a lot of data that demonstrated that medical cannabis, um, that states that had medical cannabis laws actually had less opioid overdose deaths and that cannabis is something that could be used for pain. And there's, you know, pretty good data to, to support that. So, you know, I, look, I think it's, it's complicated, um, you know, that, um, that there are certainly there is risk for people to develop addiction as there is with alcohol, as there is with, you know, tobacco, which are which are also legal. Um, but I think there are also, you know, benefits that we've seen in society with with cannabis use around seizure disorder and around pain. Um, so. You know, for cannabis specifically, it's not one thing. It's a complicated plant that has a lot of active ingredients. The science is definitely behind the policies because it's been very challenging to actually do studies with cannabis because of the federal policies. Um, but I think that we need to take a nuanced approach um, to really understand that, you know, that, you know, what cannabinoids are made of the main, the two main substances that we study right now are THC and CBD, and they act very differently. Um, but to, so to understand it better and then to be able to educate the public appropriately so that people can make educated decisions, right? right? So we need the science here and the science is very much lagging behind the policy here, um, so that we can really understand risks and benefits and that then people can make educated decisions. Right. 
I'm just glad in my neighborhood that we don't have uh, THC infused gummy bears and THC infused elixirs and soft drinks with THC in it and don't have edibles and don't have pot shops on every corner as my kids come home from school. I'm lucky because my town banned commercial sales of it, but I can't uh, I feel for my neighbors in Pleasantsville and in Atlantic City who are uh, who are going to be exposed to that at, at much higher levels, just as the black community has 13 times the number of liquor stores in black and brown communities than there are in the white communities. And I think this is a, a social justice issue as well, in, in spite of the fact it's been conflated to be. Um, Speaking about different. social justice issues, uh, first of all, have you seen the study during the pandemic? Alcohol consumption has gone up. Did you see the recent study? Yes. So it's not a matter of the corporation just promoting this. It's the individual uh, turning to alcohol as a support system. Instead of having faith as a support system, they turn to alcohol. So it's not only a one-sided equation here. Right. It's a very interesting study. Also, yeah, no, I, I think self-medication during COVID clearly has been a problem. And, and the fact that we don't have the adequate number, as you know, Dr. Cunningham, of treatments, and these become substitutes because there, there isn't the number of practitioners helping people treat. For example, anxiety amongst our young people is at record rates. We know that. So the question is, do we make available more intoxicants to for them to self-medicate with? And uh that's that's uh, the kind of that's because that's science too. It's the science of of public policy outcomes, right? We're not talking yeah, just you have, you have you have you have another issue. What about uh, all the prisoners in prisons? Uh, well, that you can decriminalize without commercializing. That was my point, Rabbi. I think I, I, mean, I, I agree. I agree. I agree. But it, I it's just a don't want to conflate problem. the two. I don't want to conflate the two, which is unfortunately how the dialogue has been put out there. We're only making a bunch of uh, corporate people really rich, and it's going to be the most vulnerable who have predisposition to addiction that are going to pay for this ultimately. And if we wanted to, to study, I agree with you, Dr. Cunningham, the science around this, we should have FDA approval, of those cannabinoids that address seizure, uh, like Marinol that's already FDA approved, um, or cannabinoids that actually address anxiety and depression, which many of them do, but they're not put through any scientific rigor if they're being sold on commercial shelves across America. But um, let me conclude uh, with this Final thought, uh, Rabbi, on how you think the medical community can work with your faith community and the broader faith community to uh, t really tackle um, this issue of addiction. I have a suggestion. I think we uh, uh, need, above all, coalition of faith communities uh, to address this very serious challenge that is affecting across the board, across the board, our uh, people. And I would recommend, in terms of awareness, if we would dedicate, just like you have a Martin Luther King Day, or you have uh, just recently, as uh, you mentioned, Holocaust International Remembrance Day, one day should be a, a weekend in a mosque on Friday in a synagogue on Saturday, in churches on Sunday, uh, just focusing on the issue that we're facing. Because what we have really, we don't have an awareness across the board of how serious this challenge is. So I think by, by, by this is a concrete suggestion. Another suggestion is, you know, theological schools, training of priests, training of uh, uh, ministers, rabbis, imams. In their senior year, there should be a subject matter introduced in every seminary because they are going to face this issue once they assume responsibility for their congregations. I don't think they're prepared for it. That's a great that's a, that's a great point, Rabbi. Maybe Dr. Cunningham can 
come to the East Park Synagogue and talk about the neurobiology of addiction so your members don't feel they're being shamed because they know it's a brain disease. Dr. Um, Bellingham, with great pleasure. <laughs> it clicks a date. <laughs> no, I believe I believe in application. Okay, you're on. You're on. Okay, <laughs> and maybe Rabbi, you can go to the medical staff reviews uh, um, that uh, the rounds that Dr. Cunningham does with new addictionologists, and you you can tell them how important faith is to the treatment of their patients. Dr. I will, make, I, I will make them read Psalm one eighteen. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Psalm 118, Dr. Cunningham. All right. You Dr. Cunningham. Away. You, you away, okay? <laughs> it's all yours, Dr. Cunningham. Wrap us up. Yeah, so I, I agree with all of this, that we need to you know, do a better job of sort of bringing the two together, um, science and faith. And, and a lot of this is through communication and really you know, addressing the stigma. The stigma, you know, frankly, is one of the biggest challenges that we face. And so acknowledging that, you know, substances are used, that there's substance use disorders, and really, you know, being open to talking about the role of science and the role of faith um, in, in substance use disorders. I think that's, you know, really just a critical first step. And I love, you know, sort of baking it into training because my, my um, you know, my thoughts are that, we're really the way that we're going to get ahead of this is that it's the the new generation, the next generation that's being trained that really has grown up seeing how much of a problem addiction is in our country and really taking this on and seeing it as part of their job, like in the in primary care and emergency rooms and hospitals, not just in the specialized addiction treatment settings, but throughout the healthcare system. And so I think it's through that training. And really bringing this conversation there is critical. Well, it's Patrick, you are a role model, and uh, I invite you to be a speaker, not just Dr. Cunningham, at Parky Synagogue, because you're a role model. You you emerged, you emerged well, with faith, with confidence. Okay. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Rabbi. I have a. Uh, uh, I was very fortunate having inspirational family members who helped orient me to a um, a response to life. Uh, and I want to conclude with that, where President Kennedy, uh, honoring his sister Rosemary, who had an intellectual disability, uh, signed the original Community Mental Health Act. And he said, people with mental illness, including substance use disorders, a need no longer be alien to our affections or beyond the help of our communities. And what was so important is he said, beyond the help of our communities, to your point, Dr. Cunningham, because it's it's more than just the psychiatric or addiction treatment centers. It's everyone's job to be part of this solution. We need more treatment. We need more medicine. We need greater access we need faith to be part of it. We need everyone to be part of it. And I thank again, uh, President Clinton for his leadership. Um, and I wanna say it's an honor for me now to, to turn it over to Dr. Shannon Frattioli um, to, to take us out. Thank you, Congressman Kennedy. And thanks to you as well, Rabbi Schneier and Dr. Cunningham for sharing your wisdom with us here today. This conversation exceeded my expectation for this final session in our Bridging Faith and Science series. I want to also acknowledge our wonderful partners in this effort. Our team here at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health is grateful for the ongoing collaboration with the Clinton Foundation and the Center for Responsible Leadership. Collaboration and partnership are so important when we're talking about substance use disorders and overdose. Substance use disorders, addiction, and overdose continue to wreak havoc on our communities, our families, and our institutions. We know the pain of this problem, and this series is all about countering that pain by elevating solutions through partnership and action. You heard President Clinton talk about the action that will follow our time together today. Please visit the Action Center site established by the Center for Responsible Leadership website. 
we have a graphic here with that URL to make that joining easy. Here's what's going to happen in the coming months. The Clinton Foundation, Center for Responsible Leadership, and the Johns Hopkins team that brought you this series is convening an executive committee that includes scientists and faith leaders from across the nation. We are charging this group with developing a statement of shared beliefs about substance use disorders and identifying concrete opportunities for faith leaders to engage in solutions and specific action items that they can embrace with their communities. We're encouraging this group to be bold and ambitious with their recommendations, to think about policy and programs as opportunities for change, and to embrace the challenge of bringing an end to addiction and overdose. We hope you will join us later this year when it's safe to gather in person to hear the committee's charge and to identify ways that each of us can contribute to ending addiction and overdose. Thank you again for joining us today and for all that you do to keep our communities safe and healthy. crisis challenges our very way of life. Hope is found in real answers. It's found in hard truths and data, under microscopes and across global networks. This is where the world turns for answers, for hope. The Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. journey began long before COVID-19. Life-saving answers originated here over a century ago, opening our doors just days before the outbreak of the Spanish flu in 1918. We introduced the fields of biostatistics and epidemiology. We guided the first clinical trials of penicillin, creating a gold standard for drug development. Our researchers helped defeat polio and are continuing the fight against malaria. We were the first to show that smoking cuts lives short, and our testimony helped break up big tobacco. If there's a threat to public health, our faculty and students are working to understand it and reduce its risks. Today, answers are sought at 80 research facilities across 67 countries. Together, we are addressing some of the biggest, most pressing threats to public health, as well as issues not yet on anyone's radar. Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health joins us live. By leading and translating public health to the world, we make policy and healthcare systems work better and inspire future researchers, practitioners, and policymakers. I don't think there's any more important job than saving and improving lives. We take what we learn and put those answers into practice. Research becomes tangible. We develop strategies and solutions the world can use and trust. And in ways big and small, we change the course of history. It's hope and determination, powered by science. Because this is where humanity finds answers. Before we even need them. And when we all need them most. Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Protecting health, saving lives, millions at a time.